Amen, guys. Well, it's an honor to be able to preach the word to you this morning. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking about superpowers this morning. What's the uh, greatest superpower to have? Come on, the right answer. Super strength. We got super strength. What else we got? You say lying? Flying. Invisibility. That's, that's, that's a weird one. Definitely super speed. Super speed. Teleportation. Teleportation. All right. Let's get one, one, two, one. Electrokinesis. We'll oh, talk after. I'm not sure that is. Super intellect. All right. All right. Let's get the last one right here. Healing. Not a gospel in the room this morning. Amen. Well, uh, uh, what we're going to talk about today, I, I put before you, is the greatest superpower of all, and that is the power of God. Title of the lesson this morning: The Power of God. It's, it's very interesting. There, there's literally billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars that have been made off of human beings' obsession with power. Yeah. And we love power. We got Superman. We got Iron Man. We got so much power in, in cinema today. We, we pray for power. We seek power. Yet the greatest power of all is in God's words right here. Yeah. Point number one, the power of of progress. The power of pro progress. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 4. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of this world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness mutual affection, to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective, and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the church said, Amen. You know, here's his man, would you increase these things in increasing measure? And it's just this laundry list of things to grow in. It's kind of overwhelming. So I mean, it's, it's a lot to focus on here. But it says, you know what? If you, in, if you increase it, all these areas, he says, you will never stumble. Yeah. I mean, that's a superpower in itself right there. Yeah. And we have to understand how the Bible explains progress and the Christian walk is that we're either pregressing, progressing, or we're regressing. Wow. The, the Christianity is not, uh, uh, it's just not a parallel line right here. It's a hill. Yeah. Right? It is that you're either progressing or you're regressing. Yeah. Now, we, we read these scriptures and think, man, like, this is incredible. The, the Bible says it has the power for us to increase in all these areas. I mean, I read that, but then I look at my life. <laughs> And I'm not progressing like the Bible. It says, I, it's like, am I broken? Or, <laughs> you know, it's like we have the same sins we struggle with year after year, month after month. Right, man, what's, what's the, how do I crack the code? Yeah, come on, bro. How do I overcome and have this progress that the Bible promises? Let's turn here to Hebrews chapter 6. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Hebrews 6, verse 7. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is far and receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. 
You know, here the Bible explains that there's two types of lands, right? We, we can have two types of hearts. The one right here says, man, it's the land that receives the rain and it gets nourishment and it grows into a bountiful harvest. And then there's the land that, that's thorny and hard-hearted and, and it says you're, you're in danger of being condemned right there. Like, man, how, how do I make sure that, that I'm that, that nurtured land? How do I make sure that I'm the thriving land? It says the thriving land drinks in the rain. What does that mean for us? I believe it's talking about drinking in the water of God's words. Yeah. Then you look around the church, man, you, you see some people that are growing so much. People get baptized and you see them grow in their discipline, in their maturity, in their character. You think, man, why is that not me? I've been around for years and years. Why aren't I growing? And the answer is simple. It's that you're not soaking in God's word enough. Wow. wow. So often we overcomplicate, man, man, why, do I, why am I not progressing? Why am I not growing? There, there's a direct correlation of how much of this, how much discipleship and how much of God's word you're soaking in. Mm -hmm. I can promise you that those in your life spiritually, those in the church who you've seen have grown the most have soaked in God's word the most. Yeah. You know, it's great here. Newton preached uh, uh, for Devo last week. Yeah. And uh, he was just preaching. One thing that he, he just sort of mentioned, he says, you know, I, I've, been, uh, I've been a disciple now, now three and a half years. Wow. And he's like, and I, I've read the Bible six times through. Wow. And it's, like, it's no coincidence that Newton has grown in an incredible way. It's because yeah. he's soaking in God's word yeah. in an incredible way. Jesus goes on to explain it a little bit deeper in Luke chapter 13. Come on, bro. Preach the word, bro. Come on, Enos. Go, bro. Christian. Preach it, bro. Come on, bro. Preach the word, bro. Come on, Christian. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 says, Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans who, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. The power of progress, you know, here... The Bible speaks of, and Jesus is addressing a situation where in the first century in Israel, people thought that in Judaism, that if you were, if something bad happened to you, it was because you had done something really wicked. Yeah. Yeah. And so they came to Jesus, they said, hey, that the people that the, the tower fell on, those people, were they just really, really wicked? <laughs> Jesus says, no, 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 no. He says, but if you don't repent, you too will all perish. Wow. The reality is, is that, that disasters and terrible things happen, and God uses those things to wake us up. Yeah. Yeah. To wake us up and make decisions. I've got to start making progress. Yeah. And I'll never forget back in uh, 2001, about half of this room wasn't even born yet. <laughs> but in uh, uh, 2001, uh, my, my father was uh, taught for, for 30 years, he taught at the high school. I went. I was. I was there for all thirty years, but I was there for four. And uh, so my, my my buddy, he taught at high school for for thirty years, and he had a Christian club, and and he had a meeting every Tuesday at lunch, and then he got some pizzas. They had food and drink. They'd have a guest speaker, and and they they averaged between about eight to twelve people every week, of uh, just attendance. And then the the Tuesday after nine eleven, guess how many people showed up? Over 150 people. Wow. Over 150. That's a, I'm not a huge math guy, but that's over 100, 200, 300,000 fold yeah. type of. Why? Why? Because people had, woke, had woken up right. of just their mortality and how fleeting life was. And it woke them up. Sadly, after a few weeks, you go back to 8 to the 12 attendants. Oh. But we have to understand, man, God wakes us, He works in our life, whether it's family, whether it's friends. Whether it's a disaster, it's, like, it's to wake us up to make a decision, man, I've got to start making progress. Yeah. Which is why it continues here in verse 6. Then he's told them this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, 
I've been coming to look for fruit on a fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. You know, here's an interesting parable about a fig tree and how this man gets really angry that it wasn't bearing fruit. Now, I don't know how much of you guys have ever gardened, but they're, they're, for, for fruit, there tends to be seasons, right? And so you, you, why couldn't it just have just been a season where, where there wasn't fruit on the fig tree? Well, what they would do back in the day is they would plant all these fruit trees, and then next to the fruit trees, they would plant a fig tree. Why? Because fig trees were famous for producing fruits year round. Wow. And what that meant is there was an expectation that there was always going to be fruits bared by the fig tree. Wow. And so this man goes to the fig tree and there's no fruit. He said, man, you got to strike it down. There's an expectation that there's going to be fruits. Wow. And as disciples, we have to understand that there's an expectation of God yeah. that we are going to bear fruits. Yeah. Now, what, what type of fruit? Well, you look at the fruits of the Spirit. God expects us to grow in our character, in our love, in our patience, in our kindness, in our gentleness. But He also expect us, expects us to multiply numerically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Newton, in his contribution, he referenced 1 Timothy 2, where, G, where God says He wants all people to be saved yeah. and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Now, the only way that people are going to come to a knowledge of the truth is if they're told what that truth is. Yeah. And the Bible says when you, when you keep with repentance, you are going to bear fruit. Yeah. And you say, Man, well, you know, I, I've been in the church, you know, I, I, for four years, and, you know, I pray, and I have my quiet times, and I, I, I run from my sin, but I haven't really been fruitful. I haven't, you know, baptized anyone. I haven't seen the, the, the church grow or my ministry. I'm, and here's the thing. If, if we, we're not seeing fruit in our life, it's because... Our repentance is not complete. Yeah. Our repentance is not complete. We have to understand that repentance is not just stopping sin. A lot of times, I know I, for myself, when I think of repentance, I think, okay, when I, when I said the Bible, I stopped smoking, I stopped drinking, I stopped doing this, I stopped doing that. And that is half of the battle. But the other half is being proactive yeah. in our repentance. Yeah. It's not just waking up, having a quiet time, which is important. But then it's about going out and sharing your faith. Yeah. It's about going out and having those tough conversations with your friends, with your family, inviting people to church, taking a stand for righteousness, even when it's uncomfortable. It's about being proactive yeah. in our repentance. Let's go, let's go back here to 2 Peter chapter 1. Come on, bro. Come on, Christian. Come on, bro. Come on, Christian. Come on. Come on, Christian. Come on, bro. You sure, bro? Let's go, bro. Come on. When you go back to a verse that we skipped over, you may have noticed, verse 3. Mm -hmm. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. You know, this is interesting. It says that His divine power has given us everything we need through our knowledge of Him. It says everything's right here. But then he goes on to, you got to go this, 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 this. So is it, do we need to apply ourselves to growing in all these areas, or do we just need to apply ourselves to pursuing God? Mm. Yes, is the answer. <laughs> it's both. We have to understand that when you pursue God with all your heart, a byproduct of that will be growth in all of these areas. Yeah. Wow. Sometimes we overcomplicate it. We think, well, I got to focus on this, and then I got to focus on that, and then I got to focus. No, 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 no. You just got to focus on God. Yeah. You just got to focus. I know a lot of us here are studying the Bible and you think, man, it's so overwhelming. I got to repent in this. I got to stop doing this. I got to start doing this one. No, no, no. You just got to commit yourself to God. Yeah. We commit ourselves. And if all of us in this room this morning took on one simple task, to wake up every morning, get into your Bible, and then apply yourself to applying what you read. Right. Apply yourself to living out what you read in the morning. Yeah. And when you do that every week, you're going to transform. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to transform. I think we overcome. You just have to make a decision that the power of progress 
is made through progressing of our knowledge of the scriptures and application of that knowledge. Amen? Yeah. The power of progress. Point number two. On, power and weakness. Power and weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, pick it up here in verse 1. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. I think, what's the third heaven? So in Judaism, they had understood the first heaven is just the sky, the second heaven is outer space, the third heaven as heaven as we would understand it. He says, so he was caught all the way up to the third heaven. He says, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than I wa is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, here Paul writes, he says, he, he was taken up to the third heaven, and he says he, he saw inexpressible things that he was not even permitted to tell us about. Wow. Which kind of makes me wish he hadn't even mentioned it. <laughs> you can't know about it. It was, it was awesome. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but he goes on, so we can't relate with that. Amen. But then he goes on and he says, but you know what? God gave me a thorn in my flesh. Mm. He gave me a thorn in my flesh. I believe that's something that all of us can relate with. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's so interesting that there have been thousands and thousands of different ideas of what this thorn could be. People, is, is it this? Is it that? Some people think it could have been a sickness, like, like malaria. Some people think he, he wrote his letters, it says in, in big letters. Some people think it may have been arthritis. There, there's other people who, who think it was this or it was that or it was temptation. The reality is we don't know right. what the thorn was, but what we do know is that life was hard for Paul. Yeah. Is that there was something in his life that it was just hard to deal with. And it says he prayed not once, not twice, but he prayed three times for God to take it away. And God said, no. Paralleling Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to go to the cross and he prays not once, not twice, three times for another way. And God tells him, no. Wow. You know, I believe what messes us up is that a lot of times we think that God promises us more than he does. Yeah. We think, that, man, I, I made Jesus Lord, man, now everything's going to be awesome. Yeah. You know, we have to understand God never promised us a perfect life, wow. a perfect job, a perfect spouse. He didn't promise us any of that, but what he did promise us is an incredible plan for our life. Yeah. And he promises if we continue to walk with him, he promises us eternal life. Yeah. But we have to understand that the, the pain and that thorn, whatever it may be, who knows? What's that thorn in your life? Maybe it's financial hardship, amen. Yeah. You know, maybe it's just a character fight that you just can't seem to overcome. Maybe it's depression, you're, you're plagued with depression, you can't seem to overcome it. And we say, God, God, take this away, let me just overcome. Here's the thing, God wants to use that thorn to glorify him. Yeah. Is that God wants our, we, we pray for our situation to change, but many times God isn't waiting for our life to change, he's waiting for you to change. Yeah. Wow. 
Then it's like, God, get me through this and change this. God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep you right where you're at. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I need you to change. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And when we start to connect with that, that you know what? God's got an incredible plan for my life. I'm always going to have issues I've got to deal with. But that God's going to use it to glorify him in a great way. It gives us a great peace. Yeah. And the incredible thing is that whatever hardship you're going through, whatever it is, because your eyes think about it. What's the hardship in your life right now? God's going to use that hardship when you get through it to help somebody else down the line. Yeah. It's, incre it's an incredible thing that when you, whatever you, you're going through, you're like, man, nobody's ever going to go through this. This is so terrible. It's so tough. And then when you make it through, you see somebody, a brother or sister, going through the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And God, you can say, you know what? God put this thorn in my life as well. Let me show you how I overcame. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to just dial in to the power of progress in relationship yeah. with God. Yeah. You know, once we do that, we, we, we have to dial ourselves into understanding that it's not about being strong, but it's about being weak. Yeah. I believe that a lot of us are issues that we're just too strong. <laughs> then we think, you know what, I, we, we wake up in the morning and you're like, you know, I, I, think I, can, I think I'll make it through today. You feel pretty good, yeah. you know, you're feeling pretty spiritual, you're like, I, I know I should pray, I should read my Bible, but I, I, don't, I, I think I, I might be all right today. And you know what happens? You make it through the day and you actually did all right. <laughs> and then you make it, wake up the next day and, and you, you made it through again. You're like, oh, I'm, God, I, thank you, Father, for making me strong. <laughs> Praise God. You know, this brother, this sister, man, they are struggling. They had a quiet time. They still tanked out. I'm not even reading my Bible or praying, but I'm doing oh pretty my well. God. And we, we feel like that it's like I, I'm just stronger than the next person. Here's the thing. You may be, and that's your issue. And that's your issue is that you do have a greater strength, a greater level of self-discipline. But what you're going to find is that you're going to hit a glass ceiling in your life. Yeah. That you just can't quite make it to the next place. Yeah. You're doing okay. Yeah. You know, you're in Bible studies. You're, you're saying pretty pure. You're, you're growing your knowledge a little bit. But you're not making it to who God wants you to be. Yeah. Because, the, but those who understand how weak they are, as if, if I don't read my Bible, I, I'm not going to make it through the end of the day. <laughs> those are the people who are the strongest. Yeah. Yep. Why? Because they understand their weakness. We've yep. got to have a strength. In our weakness. Amen? Amen. Come on. Come on. Point number three. Come on, bro. Come on. The power of love. <laughs> the power of love. First Corinthians chapter one. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. First Corinthians one. Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent, the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, yeah. a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Wow. The power of love. You know, here, Paul writes, what is the power of love? It's the power of the cross. Mm. And it says that the message of the cross, it says it was foolishness. It's a stumbling block. The Jews saw, saw Jesus die on the cross. Like, man, not my God. Right. Like, I wouldn't die of it, a, a, a thief's death on a, death on a cross. How shameful is that? I'm not going to worship him. Mm -hmm. 
But the Bible says that is the very strength wow. of God. Why? Because how is it strength? Why? Because the, the, the most powerful force in the world is love. Is love. And Jesus demonstrated that on the cross. And it's our chance now 2,000 years later by demonstrating that love by laying down our lives for one another. First Peter chapter 4. Come on, Christian. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Hopefully that sobers you this morning. It says, therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. And the church says, Amen. You know, here he says, love each other deeply. Deeply. And I believe that you look at all the incredible miracles that Jesus did. John writes that even if you were to record all of the miracles he performed, there would not be enough pages in the world to record the miracles. Yeah. The most powerful thing Jesus did was love. Wow. And so many of us, we, I, I want to get stronger in this, or I want to I get better in this, I want to get better in this. Here, the, the way to be the most Christ like is to love deeply. Yeah. That's why Jesus at the Last Supper, he says, hey, love for one another is this. You're going to demonstrate your love by one another by doing what? By laying down your lives for each other. Yeah. Now you may think, okay, well, the power of love, how, what does that really look like today's day and age? Well, let me explain to you just the power of God's love in a practical, in a practical manner here. You know, they say in rehab centers, drug rehab centers around, across America, that the sobriety rate for those who enter rehab and make it out is less than 10%. Is less than 10% of people who enter rehab and then stay sober the rest of their lives. Yet somehow, year after year after year, disciples around the world, with no formal training, sit down with people, just them and the power of God. And people give up lives of sin, lives of addiction, to pornography, to drugs, to alcohol, through the power of love. Wow. You know, there is one specific example. Our brother, Dave Kelly, he's a, a disciple in, in Hawaii. He's an appointed evangelist, and he's led churches. He's an incredible brother. But years ago, um, his father, who was a disciple, he called Kyle Bartholomew, uh, who was leading the church out there in Hilo, and he said, bro, he said, my, my son, he's like, I've taken, him into, I've taken him to rehab three times. And he said, and he keeps relapsing. He keeps going back to using. And he says, he says, could you, could you pray with him? Can you get with him? And like when he gets out of rehab and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop Dave off at rehab tomorrow morning. He's like, when he gets out, did you get some time with him? He said, bro, he says, instead of taking him to rehab, drop him off at Starbucks and let me do a Bible study with him. Ooh. And it's that he, he, he tried everything else. He said, all right, all right. Kyle sat down with Dave, opened up the Bible to Psalm chapter 119 and taught him what it looked like to seek after God with all your heart. And Dave, after two weeks of Bible studies, was baptized into Christ and out of a life of addiction. The power of God's love. And we have to understand that whatever you're dealing with in life, sometimes you think, man, the Bible is powerful, but I got this in my life. It's, I, I, it just doesn't quite have the solution for me. Or I just got, man, I got a pesky case of just lust or impurity or, or alcoholism or this or that and, or laziness or character or bitterness. And the Bible just doesn't quite have the power for me. Let me promise you one thing. The Bible has the power even for you yeah. to overcome your sin. Come on. Come on. But the only way that we're going to overcome our sin and overcome and become the man and woman that God wants us to be is if we fully invest all of our hearts. Come on. Yeah. Where we get so tripped up, we give God 50% and get frustrated why we're not overcoming. Yep. Because you're not going to overcome by giving God 50% of your heart. Yeah. You just got to make a decision this morning to get radical. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you're studying the Bible, get radical. Make Jesus so I get baptized as a disciple. Whatever you're, you're thinking about, is this worth giving up? I promise you, it's worth giving up. Yeah. But we got to believe in the power of progress. Yep. Yeah. Understand that there is power in weakness and connect with the power of God's love and truly connect with the greatest superpower of all time, the power of God. Yeah. And to God be all the glory. Yeah.